Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. And uh, we're going to continue on looking at uh, American revolutionary history and some of the chronology of it. Uh, Before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are grateful for all the things you teach us and for the time that we have each morning uh, to study together. We just ask for your presence and that you can bless those who, who are watching of these videos, uh, that they can know that you are near. And um, we pray, Lord, that um, as we spend time analyzing uh, these things, that you can help us sort through them quickly. Be with us now through thy spirit, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so we were dealing with yesterday, we were dealing a little bit with the Thanksgiving, and and Dwight did send me a... um, an email where it talks about it was actually Roosevelt. So the fourth Thursday in November is Thanksgiving. Uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt, not Theodore. So it says here, um, so it says in 1789, President George Washington became the first president to, to proclaim a Thanksgiving holiday when at the request of Congress, he proclaimed November 26th, a Thursday, as the day of national thanksgiving for the U.S. Constitution. However, it was not until 1863 when President Abraham Lincoln declared Thanksgiving to officially fall on the last Thursday of November that the modern holiday was celebrated nationally. With a few deviations, Lincoln's precedent was followed annually by every subsequent president until 1939. In 1939, Franklin D. Roosevelt departed from tradition by declaring November 23rd, the next to the last Thursday that year, as Thanksgiving Day. So it was um, the 11th day, the ninth month of the biblical year 5984. So that's a note by Dwight there. Then we we can look at the Islamic date. Um, Considerable controversy surrounded this deviation. And some Americans refused to honor Roosevelt's declaration. The next two years, Roosevelt and is it pronounced Roosevelt or Roosevelt? Anyway, repeated the unpopular proclamation. But on December 26, 1941, he admitted his mistake and signed a bill into law officially making the fourth Thursday in November the national holiday of Thanksgiving Day. So the idea is then, so he moved it. so how would somebody explain this? So we had it um, as the fourth Thursday, right, or the last Thursday. So it's going to be on the last Thursday under Lincoln, and then it's going to be changed to the fourth Thursday under Roosevelt. Is that what it's saying? Okay. Isn't that correct? The situation was that Roosevelt <clears> – <throat> had made the decision to move what had been on the last Thursday, of course, to, or the next, he he moved it from the last Thursday to the next to last Thursday. Okay. So, yeah. So, so for instance, Thanksgiving this year was on the fourth Thursday. Yeah. So on the 23rd, but originally it was the last Thursday. Well, the, it, it it had been floating quite a bit because when we look at this, those that came over at Plymouth Bay would set aside a weekday as a lecture day, a midweek church meeting. Mm-hmm. And in 1621, William Bradford invited local indigenous tribes to join with the pilgrims. Mm -hmm. Now, it became a custom in New England. That does not mean that it was being observed in the South or in the West. It wasn't a national thing. Correct. Yeah. So so we don't get it, um, I mean, officially, obviously, until the American government declares it officially, until... Uh, 1789, right? George Washington's going to be the first president, but the Continental Congress had American Thanksgiving as well, 
Right? Yes, so, they, they did it in 1777, which if we're looking at this as, we, as we've done other yeah. symbols, could be tied right back to this with Lamech. Right, so we have the seven, the 777 there. And we also have, um, then in 17, uh, was it 1782 that they, it's the first time they had it on a Thursday in November, the last Thursday in November. And then the first president to, to do that, um, then is uh, Washington. Washington, right. So. And he- and he did it on the last Thursday yeah. of 1789. Now, of course, it's going to be um, November 26th. It's also that happens to be the fourth. <laughs> so the fourth. Right. Year. But but his the, the idea that Lincoln has is is it's going to be the the last Thursday, not the fourth Thursday. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. So this is just kind of, so you've got the 1777, that's December 18th, 1777. And then you have the Thanksgiving in the National Day of Prayer, November 5th, 1782, is when it's proclaimed and it's observed November 28th, 1782. George Washington's and Lincoln's are both November 26th in different years, 1789 and 1863. Right. So it's going to continue to be the last Thursday. So I haven't. Um, so it's only going to be if the you have a Thursday as the 29th or 30th. That um, that it would make a difference, whether it's the fourth or the last. Right. Well, some some Novembers are going to have five Thursdays. Right. Those are the ones where Thursday is the 29th or the 30th. Right. Right. Because Thursday will also be the first or the second. Right. So if Thursday falls on the first or the second, then the last Thursday would be the 29th or the 30th. But otherwise, that means whatever the percentage is, five, anyway, five out of seven times, it doesn't make a difference whether it's the fourth or the last because they're going to be the same. Right. Okay. So, so when they start it, I it, mean, it's not, uh, I don't think Link, Lincoln is saying from now on, it's always going to be the, the, the last Thursday. Is he saying that when he makes that proclamation or does it just, just happen to be that way that from then on people continue to make it the last Thursday in November until Roosevelt? I believe it's, it's pretty much that. <clears throat> In, in looking at this, when George Washington did it, his was to give, was a day of Thanksgiving for the U.S. Constitution. Lincoln declared Thanksgiving basically as a, a national day to give thanks for what God had been doing in leadership with what was going on within the Civil War. Right. So his was about the Civil War. But then from then on, it's going to be the last Thursday. Right. And then when Roosevelt comes along, he changes it to the fourth Thursday. Right. And then now it says what I don't understand. So for the next two years, Roosevelt repeated the unpopular proclamation. Well, that doesn't really make much sense in the sense if we go to that to that year, so this is going to be, um, it's going to be November 23rd. Um, so it's the next to the last Thursday. In what year is that? That's going to be 1939. So when I go to 1939, so you go to, um, you know, so November 23rd is going to be um, the the second to the last Thursday, right? But then 1949, one year later, um, you wouldn't have that situation, right? And why is that? 
Does anybody know? Because, I mean, is he, because what's the fourth Thursday? I mean, I guess what's the next to last Thursday? I'm trying to figure this out. So the last Thursday, okay. So what he does is he makes it the next to the last Thursday. So that means he's going to have November 21st as Thanksgiving in 1940. Well, yeah, I think that's what's going to happen because if he's going to do it to the next to the last Thursday, yeah, that's going to be like November 21st. And then it's going to be November 20th, uh, the next year, because there's a leap year in there. So what I'm saying is it goes from the 23rd. Well, instead of the last Thursday, but then he's going to change it to the fourth Thursday. So I guess maybe what, what happened is he made a mistake. I, I'm just trying to understand this mistake, you know, what it means. Right. So if you you understand what I'm saying. Okay. So if well, we go back here, so let's just take a look at this again. Uh, so in 1939, he's going to be November 23rd. And that doesn't seem too bad, right, for now. Um, but technically, it could have fallen on November 30th that year. All right. Now, right. let's... Now, it's also the 11th day of the ninth month uh, and and uh, the 10th day of the 10th month on the Islamic calendar, just since we got it up here. The Islamic calendar has that symbol. But anyway, okay, go on. Let's remember what was going on globally at that time. Yeah, but you have a war. We, we have a war in Europe, but we have the effect of the depression right yeah that's kind of near its end by then but yeah but the the depression itself did not begin to really become alleviated until the war was in full swing yeah and that's because the reason why the depression lasted so long was because of the actions of roosevelt um it actually Depression. Well, it it was, yeah. the the <laughs> actions of Roosevelt, the actions of John Maynard Keynes, mm -hmm. a lot of the the you know the very left wing economic thought. Yeah, so they they actually created all these problems. If they had ignored the depression, because they had one in the twenties that was ignored and it just went away, and this one would have gone away as well. Okay. It would have corrected itself. But anyway, that's so, a whole other problem. So at the beginning of, of Roosevelt's presidency, Thanksgiving was not a fixed holiday. It was up to the president to issue a Thanksgiving proclamation to announce when the date was going to fall. Right. Now, even though they always did this, they always did it as the last Thursday in November. Since 1863. Okay. Now, right. so that that's something I know because I did research that. So it was always the last Thursday in November. Now here, because the last Thursday in November is the 30th, he chooses to make it the next to the last Thursday in November. Right. Um, but I don't think he's making it like officially. We're always going to have it that way. Or is he? Is he stating here that it's always going to be the penultimate Thursday in November? Okay. The main the main thing about this mm -hmm. was Roosevelt was making another economic decision because at that time most people would begin their holiday shopping after Thanksgiving. Okay. So the decision when they're looking at this when Roosevelt first took office. His first Thanksgiving was on November 30th. And that left 20 shopping days before the holidays. Yeah. Business leaders felt that this was denying them economic 
relief mm -hmm. because they felt that extra week of shopping would bring much more money for them. So it makes sense in 1939 to move it to the second to the last Thursday. But it's also the fourth Thursday in this case. Right. right. So then the question is, does that mean in the next year that he's going to have Thanksgiving in 1940? Is he going to have Thanksgiving on the 21st? That's the question. I would assume okay. that to be correct. That's going to be the second to the last. And then that would be also the case in 1941. It would have been on November 20th, right? So then he's going to correct it in the next year instead of having it on November 19th, which is where it would have been, he's going to move it to the 26th in 1942, right? Okay. So back to the original one, date that George Washington had and the original date that um, Abraham Lincoln had, right? So they had their first ones on November 26th. Yeah, it's kind, of, it's kind of interesting, too, to consider that when he then issued the direct proclamation making this the fourth Thursday. Yeah. That this was 18 days before the attack on Pearl Harbor. So Pearl Harbor, that's going to be in 1941, isn't it? Correct. So... So he's going to change it in that year? It becomes official when he's going to push this to the fourth Thursday. It becomes official in 1941. So in 1941, it's it's going to be the 27th? No, it's going to be the 20th. Okay, so that would be the third Thursday. No, it's the fourth. Well, isn't it? Okay. No. Nope. So if you okay, go back, that would be, be the 27th, and I'm wrong. Sorry. So that's 10 days before Pearl Harbor. Um, yeah. So if it's going to be the 20th, yeah, Pearl Harbor is going to be, yeah. So it would be the, in 1941, it says he did it for the next two years. So 39. So the next two years would be 40 and 41, right? Right, so that means it would be the 20th. If, and it would be in 42 that he changes it back to the, he changes it to the fourth, not the last, but the fourth, because that's the way it is okay. now. It's the fourth. All right. But, but, but making it the penultimate one, that made it rather early. He could have just done it in 39 as the fourth, and that would have been sufficient, right? Okay. So, Stake was making it the second to the last Thursday, but then he made it into law that it's going to be the fourth from then on, right? Which the president still ceremonially proclaims it, but it's already determined when it's going to be, right? Um, so, so anyway, it, it, it is, it is rather interesting. So, yeah, so you just have to look up when Thanksgiving in 1941 was to make sure that it was November 20th. So then he's going to correct it in 42. So that's going to be, you know, 79 years after Lincoln's. Lincoln first has his Thanksgiving on the Thursday. Being uh, the last Thursday, but the last Thursday is sometimes the fourth. But here he's going to make it so it's always the fourth. So since then, it's always been the fourth Thursday, right? In November. Okay, I know that's kind of a, a tedious little detail that we spent a lot of time on, but um, we have to get it correct, right? Okay. Okay, so, so now I understand it. So now that's why we could have Thanksgiving on November 23rd uh, this year, right? Because it's the fourth Thursday, right? But he declared the next to the last Thursday, my understanding, and continued that. So for the next two years, Roosevelt repeated the unpopular proclamation on December 26, 1941, 
He admitted his mistake and signed a bill into law officially making the fourth Thursday in November uh, the national holiday of Thanksgiving. So, so that's how it is today. So it's an interesting little history um, and took us a little bit of time to understand that properly. Okay. Now, I had a slide here that when I first showed. Okay, so we're going to go to this slide. So I want to move away from Thanksgiving to uh, something that Jeff brought up. So back in 2018 at the camp meeting in October, um, Jeff had was presenting. He originally was going to present on the number eight, uh, but he ended up getting sidetracked, of course, because what Tess had presented um, on October 3rd and then the subsequent light that had come in regard to, um, you know, the 391 and a half years. Um, let me see here. So, yeah, so the 391 and a half and just all this stuff that was going on. Um, so that, so, that, so November 9th was this big thing, but Jeff is going to be presenting about July 27th. And, and why would Jeff be talking about July 27th in October of 2018? So Tess had just presented, uh, about November 9th, but now we have July 27th. 1789. What what is there about July 27th that has anything to do with what Tess presented? Does anybody know? I know there's not a lot of people here. To, but what, Tess, wasn't this the yeah. date that they had been looking for for this regarding Islam in 1299? Yeah. So that's not the reason. Though though see so. I end up looking for this, like, to me, the July 27th date is significant because of Daniel from Brazil. So Daniel from Brazil is going to discover this 126 days pointing to October 13th on July 27th, right? Now, Tess, so that's not something that Tess had any part in. What she had part in was the November 9th date. Now, are we familiar with the 9th of Thermidor? Not completely. Okay, so the 9th of Thermidor is in, it, it's, it's on the French Republican calendar. And it's going to be in 18, I'm trying to remember when the, the, the date, when the year is. But uh, July 27th, is the ninth of Thermidor. That is, it's 9-11. Thermidor is the 11th month, the ninth day. So it's 9-11. And it's one of the dates that Tess brought up. So Jeff then is going to look at this ninth of Thermidor and see that it's July 27. It's going to remind him of, obviously, Josiah Lich's prophecy. And Tess was using these spans of years, 490 years and, and different things like that. Um, and so, so Jeff had noted that in 1789, we have the State Department, right? So, so what, Dwight, what do you know about the State Department in 1789? Well, <clears throat> July 27th, 1789. I believe that's the date that the, the State Department was originally established so that it would begin okay. having um, a channel through which to have communication with other nations. Yeah, Foreign Affairs, the Department of Foreign Affairs, right? That mm -hmm. is um, an act establishing an executive department to be dominated denominated the Department of Foreign Affairs. So that's going to be on July 27th, 1789. So Jeff no, notices this, right? Now, of course, uh, when we look at this, we can see there's 490 years. But prior to 1789, in 1782, we have the Great Seal, 
right? So the history of the Great Seal is the thing that that I find interesting here. So we also have this 490 years, and so we're just going to look at this um, as soon as I find the next slide. So you see the seal there, and then you're going to have um, it's going to be which slide? This is no, I think this is the slide. Okay, yeah. So what you have on on your screen there is a period of 13 years uh, that's going to be marked. So this is from July 4th, 1776 to um, this is going to go all the way to September 15th, 1789, 13 years. Now, the 13 years, of course, is a symbol that's uh, part of the United States. It's because of the 13 colonies, the 13 colonies that make up the United States when it uh, begins. And then, of course, it, you know, the symbols related uh, to the Great Seal that have the number 13 in them. Okay. Now, 13 can be divided as 6 and 7. Right. So you have this number of perfection and this number of a man, and together they make this number of rebellion, right? That the symbols. Now, um, so what we have here, and I know it's probably tiny, so it's a little bit hard to see. I'm going to make this a bit bigger. Okay, it's too big. Okay, so what you see, I have July 4th, 1776. Now they name a committee to make this seal. Now, what, what's the purpose of a seal? And why is this important as a symbol in relationship to the United States? Symbolic representation of the country. Right. And we know the Sabbath is the seal of God, right? Correct. Okay. So we have the United States creating the seals. This is a symbolic representation of uh, the territory. Um, uh, what are the three things in a seal that that generally we mark out in regard to the Sabbath. Um, office. Office. Dominion. Dominion. And, um, the office, name. dominion. Name. Okay. Yes. Okay. So, so those are contained within the Sabbath, right? But anyway, in July 4th, 1776, this first committee is named. Now, um, then we're going to have a second committee formed, March 25th, 1780, and then a third committee formed in 1782. Um, so it seems kind of odd that they keep having these committees, but I guess things are pretty busy and things don't get quite done just because you have a committee. <laughs> so that third committee is going to... Uh, have Charles Thompson chosen to design this seal, right? So that's going to be June 13th, 1782. And, and then seven days later, he's going to a design, uh, submit his design, and it's going to be accepted, right? So um, I do have a paper on the Great Seal. I'm just trying to see. Maybe this might be better. Look at my paper as well, because I have this stuff in the paper. Um, so let's see if we can go there, because then you could see some of this a little more visually. So this is what the seal looks like presently, right? This paper I did. So the history. So it talks about the first committee. Um so this is going to be the Continental Congress that names this first committee to design the Great Seal, our national emblem for the country. Um, so you need this as an official symbol of sovereignty to formalize and seal or sign internal international treaties and transactions. It took six years, three committees, and the contributions of 14 men before the Congress finally accepted a design, which included elements proposed by each of the three committees. So these committees... Uh, you can see some of these designs. Um, some of them are fairly complex. Talks about the pe people who are involved in it. Uh, the first one, Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, um, and three of the prim five primary authors of the Declaration of Independence. So they were on that first committee. So, so they had some different ideas. 
So this one's uh, in 17. So this, so these some of these early designs are pretty basic. Uh, then what you're going to get is, um, trying to see here. So yeah, they got all these different things. This is just a bit of a history of where they got some of this different information or ideas from that they put into the seal. Uh, so the third committee has this as um, this is a third committee's proposal drawn by William Barton. After two more years, Congress formed a third committee. Right. So this is on May 4th, 1782. John Rutledge, Arthur Middleton, Elias Oudinot. Arthur Lee replaced Rutledge, although he was not officially appointed. As with the two uh, previous two committees, most of the work was delegated to a heraldic expert, this time 28-year-old William Barton. Barton drew a design very quickly using a rooster on the crest, but it was much too complex. No drawing of this design seems to have survived. Uh, then they had a Hopkins pyramid from 1778. So they're going to use some of these things. And then you're going to have, this is a letter about the final design. Um, and so what you're going to end up with is something like this. Um, so he kept Barton's design. So Thompson here essentially kept Barton's design, but re-added the triangle around the eye of Providence and changed the modus, motos to Anuit. Optus and Novus Ordo Seclorum, right? And then, um, so the, here, this is where the various states of interest, July 4th, so the different ones I have on that list. Um, and then, uh, so the seal is first used by Thompson and kept in his care for seven years. So he's going to make this seal, and then he's, he has it for seven years. And then on July 24th, 1789, President Washington asked Thompson to deliver the seal to the Department of Foreign Affairs in the person of Roger Alden, who kept it until the Department of State was created. In 17, uh, September uh, 15, 1789, the United States Congress ordered that the seal heretofore used by the United States in Congress assembled shall be and hereby is declared to be the seal of the United States. So the State Department's going to be uh, created three days after President Washington asked Washington asked Thompson to deliver to the seal to the Department of Foreign Affairs and the person of Robert Alden, right? So, and he kept it until the State Department was created, so three days later, right? So, um, so the dates laid out are remarkable in many ways. We see symbols like 770, 810, 40, and 88. Especially significant are the spans associated with June 20th, 1782. So what we're going to see here is this is that chart I showed of 13 years. Make this a little bit bigger. Okay. You can see I have the first four until the seal is made. And then the seven years, right? So, so if we put this together with this 490 years, what we can see is that there's 490 years, and then from 1782 to 1789, there is seven years, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. Now, the thing to know here is July 27th in 1299, that's a Julian date. It's the 26th day of the fourth month, right? So from Josiah Lich's prophecy, we find that symbol Repeated, it's a symbol that relates to um, all of the dates of July 27th, whether Julian or Gregorian. And also, it's the date that we used for the July 18th prediction, right? So it's the 26th day of the fourth month in 2020. And and also, we had the, the 10th day of the fifth month in 2020 was July 18th to Julian. So we have this Julian and Gregorian date, date 13 days apart. Now, the Gregorian date in 1299 is August 3rd, right? So you can see that they're a little closer together back then. They're only seven days apart instead of the 13 that they are um, today. That is, um, if you take the Julian and Gregorian, they're 13 days separate now. Back then, they were seven days separate. 
Now, the interesting thing is the number of days. So if I go from July 27th, 1299, to July 27th, 1789, what are the number of days that it shows there? 178,969. Okay. Well, yeah. So to July 27th, it's 962. But, okay. And it's going to be 17,969 to August 3rd. So if I go to the August 3rd date, I'm going to get the year 1789 and 69, which is a symbol of the 69 weeks. Right. right. Okay. And then if, if I just go to July 27th, I get 1789 plus the symbol for the 62 weeks. But now if we're, if we're looking at this also, you've got the 480, as you're saying, 483 years or 69 weeks. So right. it's, it's all part of that 490 year prophecy. Right. So we're going to have the seven years at the end. Right. right. So we can see the symbols here are the symbols for the year 1798 and also the symbols for the 62 weeks and the 69 weeks plus the 490 years. Right. Um, and that's going to be in between the second and third committee, there's 770 days, and that symbol seven, seven times 70. So you can see the symbols there um, uh, that relate to, to this. We have seven days, we have 40 days, 88 days, um, symbol of the resurrection. Um, so, so anyway, the point is you have the fact that you have this span of time in 490 years, giving you 1789 as a part of that, of the number of days, symbolizing that 1789 with the 62 and the 69. So then what I'm doing is I'm taking July 27th, 1299, and counting J July 27th uh, on, on the one's a Julian date, one's a Gregorian date. And it's going to be 178,962 days. If I count from August 3rd to August 3rd, uh, the other thing is you can see that August 3rd in 1789 is the 10th day of the fifth month. That other symbol that we used from Ezekiel's prophecy for July 18th. So, so it ties together. This Gregorian date gives me the symbol of the 10th day of the fifth month in 1789. So, so it's just like with the Hiroshima, uh, you know, line. We have these symbols uh, that are tied together with these spans of times and these dates. And so then you'll notice if uh, we have the symbol for midnight. Midnight, of course, is six days before uh, July 27th. And I, I put it in there just to show you that that is the 26th day of the fourth month in 1789. I don't have an event for that date. And same with August 3rd. They're just symbolically represented there. Right. Um, and then the seven years is just from June 20th, 1782, when they first, um, they, they complete the seal. Right. And so for seven years, that seal is just sitting. Right. Which is is kind of it's kind of bizarre that they do that. So it's going to be the design is submitted and accepted. Right. In 1782. So that that's when they have it now. So September 16th, the seal is going to be used by Thompson. So that means it's been made and they can use it. But they're going to wait seven years. Before. They're going to actually have a State Department and they're going to have it brought to the State Department. And then um, and then in S September 15th, 1789. So that's one year less a day from when Thompson first uses the seal. Uh, to when it's uh, Congress ordered that the seal there for there to for used by the United States in Congress assembled shall be and hereby is declared to be the seal of the United States. So it just happens just within that seven years. So it's uh, 
the end of seven years before September 16th for when the seal is first used. Um, so I think it's pretty remarkable that we have all of these structures connected to the seal. Right. So this is just the other one showing all of those spans that we looked at before the 13 years. Uh, 2,177 days, 2,644 days. So you can see the symbol for midnight there with the doubling of the seven and then the symbol for the 26th day of the fourth month with the doubling of the four in the six years and the seven years. Um, so any, well, and the, oh, and the, the other thing too is if you go from that date and you go back 25, 20 days, it brings you to October 22, 1882, just as a, or, or pardon me, 1782, as as a symbol. So, so any thoughts about this this great seal? I, I can, you know, I'll, I'll put attach this to the video because I believe I do have it on my uh, academia page. If not, I'll put it on there and I'll put a link to it. For people who want to look at it in more detail. Um, so we have the State Department, we have this July 27th, 1789 date, and then we have the seal connected to it. So the significance there in the context of what we have been studying, what's the significance regarding this seal and its relationship to what happened in 977? Is there any relationship that we can see? Um, and of course, this 490 years as a symbol is interesting. But, um, what is it telling us? Because this, here we have this about the United States. So we have the United States being compared, this, this Revolutionary War being compared to what happened, um, in 977 BC at Jeroboam. And, we're not looking at who's the good guys, who's the bad guys necessarily. It's just the separation from a United Kingdom. In this case, America, United Kingdom, Britain, the colonies. In the case of uh, Jeroboam, they have the United Kingdom of Israel that's going to be broken apart, right? And so we have these symbols, 13 years that would symbolize rebellion, Um from 1776 to 1789. Anything, anything else here? So is this in this situation because of the taxation, because of the lack of representation, other things? Are we, are we looking then that the colonies have some type of a representation to Israel and Britain, some type of representation to that of Judah in a symbolic manner. Okay, so yeah, so that's the kind of idea. You got Israel and Judah, and we're attaching this just from the taxation point point of view. Now, in this case, it's reversed, right? As far as who breaks away, right? The United well, States is northern Israel as a symbol but that's what i was saying yeah so it's it's reversed from that history like we take 977 we just reverse who's doing the taxing or do we no we don't okay we don't we don't re okay yeah right yeah we don't okay i just doubly reversed it <laughs> so we don't reverse the taxing but we do we do have we have um, the United States leaving, and that would be a parallel to the tribes that leave, right? So, okay, let's see what you're saying. Now, we're going to have them reversed later, though, when it comes to the Civil War. Correct. Okay, but here they're not reversed. Correct. Okay. Yeah, and... So now when it comes to this creating of the seal um, and, and the other thing that we had in that one chart that I was looking at, this one here, notice we have the seal. I also have the dollar sign there. 
1785. Um, I'm not sure why I put it there particularly, uh, but the dollar is in 1785. That's when they're going to create this symbol for the dollar. So uh, the whole idea is that this is connect connected with this taxation. So they create their own seal. They create their own uh, dollar and the symbol for the dollar. And then, uh, then they're going to have the state department. So these are things that are needed for, them to be an independent nation, right? In 1776, you can have a declaration of independence, but it doesn't automatically create a different nation in the sense that other people recognize it, okay? So, so we have all of these symbols and we can, so what about what happens to Jeroboam? So we have the Thanksgivings, right? So he has this feast that and what about him offering on the 15th day of the eighth month? Is there any significance in that in relationship to this history? And, and what he's doing, what happens to him? So he's offering, he's a king, and he's operating as a priest. He's offering offerings in Bethel. And then he he's going to have, uh, the altar is going to be broken. The ashes are going to be poured out. And then his hand is going to be uh, withered, and then it's going to be restored. Now, what do these symbols mean in connection with this history, if anything? Can we attach any of the symbols in 1 Kings chapter 13 to this history? So let's just read this again. So we've gone over this before, but... Behold, a man of God came out of Judah by the word of the Lord to Bethel. Jeroboam was standing by the altar to make off. So he's going to be doing this on the 15th day of the eighth month. We know. He's in Bethel. And the man cried against the altar by the word of the Lord and said, O altar, O altar. Thus saith the Lord, behold, a son shall be born to the house of David, Josiah by name, and he shall sacrifice on you the priests of the high places who make offerings on you, and human bones shall be burned on you. And he gave a sign the same day, saying, This is the sign that the Lord has spoken. Behold, the altar shall be torn down, and the ashes that are on it shall be poured out. And when the king heard the saying of the man of God, which he cried against the altar of Bethel, Jeroboam stretched out his hand from the altar, saying, Seize him. And his hand, which he stretched out against him, dried up, so he could not draw it back to, him, draw it back to himself. Okay, so... Uh, we know the altar is going to be torn down. The ashes are poured out, right? And then the king said of the, to the man of God, entreat now the favor of the Lord. Can I have my hand restored to me, right? And the king's hand was restored to him. It came as it was before, right? Um, so let's just take a look at this. So one is we know it's chapter 13, Right? So does that connect us already to that, the 13 colonies, right? We talked about that before. That can have a an interesting symbolic connection. Okay. So, so we can see that there is this connection here. So we can, we can connect it to the American Revolutionary War. Uh, we also had looked at it and, and connected it to the Civil War as well to some degree. But, but I think primarily we would connect it to this American Civil War. Okay, um, now what about what's happening here? We have this, we have the date, the 15th day of the eighth month, August. It's a symbol of midnight, uh, we also, or midnight cry. And then we also have altar, altar, again, a symbol of the midnight cry. So what else can we do with this? What would we try to find as symbols? Because we've looked at Hebrew numbers. So when we look at some of these these words, so I'm just going to bring up the Hebrew numbers here. So maybe there's something that connects us to to these to these dates, these symbols. Looking at these numbers, is there anything that jumps out at us as far as the different words that are used? So things that I would look at um, things like four one five nine and four one nine six. We we talked about this before. So we have this sign. And this altar. Now, 
Can we attach a sign to the idea of a seal? I would think that's possible. Okay. Yes. And, and, and why can we do that? Wouldn't it be by using the elements of the seal? Okay. The elements of a seal. Now we know that, uh, the Sabbath is a sign between us and God that we may know that he's the Lord that sanctifies us. It's different, different Hebrew word, but the idea of signs and seals are commonly equated in scripture. Right? Correct. Okay. So we have this idea of this sign. Now, so if we take this sign, um, that would connect us to the great seal. And when we go to the great seal, we have symbols that attach us to the symbols that we have attached to our history. Now, one of the symbols that we don't think about much is the 2,604 days of the prophetic mirror. We know that's a symbol of 26 day of the fourth month, right? So from that's going to be with the Civil War in 742 to the Civil War in 1863. We're going to have that. But if we have this sign, so if we take this sign that is given, is this sign that's given here that is going to be this 390 years, right? Because that's what it's going to be. It's 350 years. It's going to be the sign of of Josiah, right? So we're going to have a child that's born onto the house of David. So he's going to be the king. He's going to be called Josiah. He's going to um, offer the um, uh, he's going to offer upon uh, the priests of the high places that burn incense upon me, right? So men's bones shall be burnt upon this altar. So, so what would be the symbols here uh, with Josiah? So we know Josiah is um, Joshua, the name of two Israelites. It means founded of Yah. So Joshua has to do with a foundation, with something that started, right? So this is the foundation of the United States. So Joshua is attached as a symbol to a foundation. Is that significant? Would we say that that's a significant symbol? This is talking about the foundation of the United States. I would say that it would have to have significance. Yeah. <laughs> Significance. Yeah. So it's got significance. Now we know, of course, the altar being rent. Uh, remember with Jeroboam, uh, he's going to have this prophet that comes and takes the cloak off him and, and tears it into 12 pieces, right? Right. It's going to be rent, right? So that's going to be the same idea. Um, so the kingdom is being rent from uh, from Rehoboam and given a peace given to Jeroboam. Um, and then Jeroboam here, uh, he's going to offer up on this altar and the altar is going to be. And I know it's probably hard to see all these numbers here, but is, are there any other numbers of significance that we can note? Like any of these words um, where the numbers are significant. Okay. So what about Bethel? So, so this is the altar in Bethel. Is there any significance of the number 1008? Anybody who studied the 2520 should be familiar with this symbol. What is the argument that Uriah Smith makes about the four seven times? Uh, it's sort of a mocking argument. Anybody know what that argument is? That uses this symbol 1008 in it. The argument is if there's four seven times, then we would have to add 2520 together to get 10,080 years, correct? Anybody familiar with that argument that Uriah Smith makes? I've seen it repeated by others. Okay, so Ryan says yes, he's seen that argument. So, so Bethel being uh, this 1008, four times 252. What book was it in? It all. <laughs> Um, I believe it's in a Daniel and Revelation. So in the book Daniel and Revelation, he makes that argument. Uh, if I'm if if I'm not mistaken, I don't. Th it's not in the original, uh, uh, the one that he wrote in 
1864, the January 26th uh, Review and Herald, where he says it's not a prophetic period. I believe it's in the footnote, if I'm, if, if I'm not mistaken. I could be wrong. But it's in the footnote um, in uh, Daniel and Revelation. But, but anyway, so what would be the significance? Bethel is four times 252. Right. If you added another 252, you'd get 1260 because five times 252 is 1260. So does this have anything to do with anything? Right. So remember, he's going to have uh, two different places as well. He's going to place one in Dan. So uh, Dan is uh, the Hebrew number 1835. And then he's going to have one in Bethel. That's the number is uh, 1008. So what would be the significance of that? Any significance? I guess I'm just not tracking this question. Well, I'm just asking if there's any significance. I'm not saying that I see any significance. I do with Bethel. The 1835, I don't know the significance of that on its own, if there's any significance there. Of the word or the year? Well, well, I'm saying of, of either. So, you know, the Hebrew number is 1835. If if there's some significance in the year 1835 that we would have to take note of, I don't know, right? But we have this 1008, which we can connect to the 2520. Well, 1835 being the second year of the 10 years of the Feast of Trumpets. The, ma- the name meaning of either is what? The the what's that? What is the name meaning abider? The word meaning. Okay, abider. Well, didn't you say eighteen thirty five was abider? Sorry. No. That's going to be Dan. Okay. So that's Dan judge. Is, that's judge. Yeah. So Dan is a judge. And the house of God. So we have those two things. I don't know if Iran sees anything in the gematria of these verses. Or... So I know, you know, I'm asking people to to notice things that we haven't noticed yet. Now, the only the only thing that I'm I'm looking at in, in this particular section comes back down to First Kings twelve thirty three, because there again we wind up with one five eight. Okay, explain that again. Okay. I said the only thing that, you know, you you have this highlighted on 1 Kings 12.30. Okay, yeah. But if we come down to 1 Kings 12.33, yeah. we have the 158 being noted here again. Yeah, the 15th day of the eighth month. Yeah. Right. Right, so they're going to mention it in 32 and 33. So, so first they're going to say that he created this feast, feast day. And then they're going to say that he's going to all offer on the altar on that day. So this the is on the altar of the burnt incense. This is a league, an improper league. Mm-hmm. An improper league made even with those of the judge. And then, of course, from what Iran was just noting, the differential in First Kings twelve thirty would be two hundred eighty-two. Okay, what would be the significance of two eighty-two? Oh, right. So if you take a thousand, that's called a complementary number. So to July eighteen seven eighteen, two eighty-two is a complement to it. So it gives us a symbol of July eighteen. In 12 verse 30. Now, the previous verse, so this is where we're going to, it's going to mention Dan and Bethel. Right. So he set one and he set the one in Bethel. Is there anything about this verse? So we have to figure out if there's anything in here that we could note. And, you know, and of course, I haven't done this yet. I'm just looking at all of these different Hebrew numbers, and it's probably not the best time to do that. If there's anything that jumps out here. So we got Dan and Bethel. So we have the Bethel one. 
I just know there's something here that we're not seeing. So we've got the ashes. I'm looking at that. The 1880. So there's got to be something here. But anyway, for now, we're just going to leave that, that part alone. So we have symbols. So we have symbols attached to these verses. And these symbols would be, uh, we have the seal, we have the sign, and that sign is going to be connected to our understanding of American history. So we're going to be applying these symbols. And, and this is going to be about Josiah. So definitely we have an understanding of the prophecy of Josiah, Josiah Lich, and Josiah the King that are connected with July 27th. Connected with this seal. Connected with the State Department. So, so we can, we can take American history just in the simplest way. We can see that we have these symbols and these symbols relate to these prophecies that are connected with Ezekiel and the 2520, et cetera. Correct? Agreed. Even though we can't see all of the symbols yet. Um, now, for instance, you know, one that I knew it was here. When he put forth his hand, we have that 3027, right? We have the symbol for the Levites there. Now we can say, well, you know, that, that word hand is pretty common, but it's here in this context. So all of these things, the name Josiah, connecting to the prophecy of Josiah, obviously from Ezekiel, which gives us the basis for using Ezekiel um, in the way that we do. And then we also have uh, Josiah Lich, and those symbols are all attached to these uh, these events in American history that we saw in connection with the seal and the start of the United States. And um, this hand being stretched out and then and being healed. So this is a hand that's restrained and a hand that's loosed. Now, we normally attach that to Islam, right? But we could see we could attach it to Trump. Can we attach that to America, a hand that's restrained and a hand that's loosed? I would think yes. So how would we do that if we were going to explain it to someone? Okay, well, let's think about one other thing. Um, now, when it comes to currency, to money, because we have that here, this symbol in 1785. So they're going to get this symbol for the American dollar, and there's a dispute where, where the symbol even actually came from. came from a symbol, some people think, from the pesos. But, you know, other people have fanciful interpretations of it. So you got the seal, you got the dollar sign symbol, right? So you have a sign and a seal attached. And then you have the State Department, and you have this July 27th date. Ties us to the prophecy of Josiah. Any Anything else there? Well, the things that are coming up in my mind about being restrained and loosened, wouldn't it have a lot to do with the economic basis of the United States? Yeah, that's where I'm thinking, right? Okay. So that, that this symbolizes um, the taxation and the freedom then from taxation. Wouldn't you say that their hand is restrained by the, the the taxation that happens. That's part of it. Okay. But while while what the about United, the while the United States restrained the hand of Islam, mm -hmm. didn't Islam in a way also restrain the economic engine that has been the United States? Yeah, and, and we can see that at the beginning because obviously with the Barbary Coast um, and the pirates uh, basically taking out American ships, raiding them, robbing them, whatever. I mean, that's kind of a restraint as well. Very much. Yeah. So, so we often attach this restraint and loosening to Islam, but it's also attached to the idea of what's going to happen at the end of the world. That there's these these winds that are restrained, they're going to be loosed. So it's not just Islam. And we, we often attach that to economics. Wars as well, but it's, economics are always going to be affected. 
So, so the one thing that we're doing here is we're attaching the prophecy of Islam to what happens with America becoming a, having a state department, right? That's what Jeff was doing. He said, we'll get these two July 27th dates. Now, of course, in those two July 27th dates, uh, we know that one's Julian and one's Gregorian, but, and we can't just use like, the, the idea is the 26th day of the fourth month, like we do with July, Josiah Lich's prophecy. But we can, of course, attach it in, in the way that we take these, um, these symbols here and we place these other dates around it. And we can see the 26th day of the fourth month, the 10th day of the fifth month is attached. Also, this symbol of the week of Christ. So, or the 70 weeks but with this week of Christ, this seven years. And so this is about a covenant then, isn't it? Yes. Okay. Because Christ is going to confirm the covenant with many for one week. Now, Christ confirming the covenant, it says in Daniel chapter 9, when it talks about the 70-week prophecy, it uses this phrase. He's going to seal up vision and prophecy. Now, that word seal up, we often think of it as close up, right? But it also is just the idea of the reason why it comes to close up is because when you take a document, like a letter, and you put a seal on it, it's closed up. But it's still, in order to seal something up, you need to have this mark or seal placed on it, right? Be correct. So we can see how all of this relates to that seal of the United States in this sort of, and I don't want to use the word counterfeit, but it is, it is a, it is for Northern Israel. So Northern Israel is not, it's not representing God. Now we know, of course, the United States has horns like a lamb, but it will speak as a dragon. So we know that the, the constitution has principles in it that are godly, right? So, and we know that northern, northern Israel is still God's people, just as Judah is. Uh, but they're just like Judah; they're given an opportunity. God says to Jeroboam, "You know, if you obey my voice, right, everything's going to go well." But of course, Jeroboam doesn't. So, so we can see that with the United States, it has this sense of being the land, you know, promised land, so to speak, right? Right. Um, but it's not going to fulfill its purpose as God, God's perfect will would intend it to. It's going to depart from it, just as northern Israel. And when they're given that opportunity to receive the message that William Miller is going to give at the beginning of their history, the Protestants are going to be tested. Uh, they're going to fail that test with the first test. And they're going to have a moral fall. Right, so the Protestants fall. So we can see how this is all related. Now, you know, we haven't drawn those lines really firmly because we, we're, we're searching for these lines, right? We're seeing them. But if we think about it, we can see that this is all connected. That it's not something we're doing that's arbitrary. Now, there's probably a lot more that we're not noticing in this as well. So, so that's the thing that we have to do is we have to dig a bit deeper to understand this. Okay, so any final thoughts before we close with prayer? Not for me. Okay, so tomorrow I'm going to try to bring some of this together a little clearer. Normally what I try to do on Thursday, so so that's what we'll do. Okay, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study this morning. We ask for your continued help in our personal study, in our lives. And um, thank you for the time that we had together and uh, reading from your word and uh, studying American history. Help us to understand these things clearly. We pray for all those searching for truth that you can lead and guide them. And we pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.